fantastic. A little bit of the backstage that you guys are seeing. Um, going back to our presentation, uh, the cowbell. Um, and in presentation mode, here we go. So we've gone through the logistics. Here's what we're gonna do. Our speakers are going to have um, a total of about 10 minutes. And what we're gonna do is at halftime on, on the, uh, the speaker's talks, just to give them an idea of where they are in their timing, um, we're gonna have at five minutes, this noise. It's hard to hear. Let me see if I can turn that volume up a little bit. Okay, so that'll be five minutes. Don't be alarmed if you hear uh, Big Ben chirp. And then um, we'll have a, another sound at one minute, at the one minute warning. Again, these are sort of uh, some rituals that we're playing around with. So it's like a car horn. And then finally, the cowbell. At the end, when you're done at 10 minutes, our speakers know to wrap things up at the cowbell. So that's the cowbell. I'm gonna hand it over to, uh, back over to Ezekiel real quick to talk about the Q&A, just to make sure everybody knows how that's working. All right, so Q&A feature, if you haven't found it yet, you can find that toward the bottom of your Zoom window and you will see a little icon that says Q&A. So you click on that and you'll get a pop-up uh, Q&A window where you can place your, your questions. Um, so we will try our best to answer the questions either either verbally or by text response in the Q&A feature. And any unanswered questions today, we will do our best to respond to your questions in a blog post after, after the webinar. Back to you, Mark. Actually, back to you, Arna. Um, I uh, want to introduce our, our two uh, uh, guest uh, speakers for today, and I'm really happy and very proud to have them here. So because our theme of today is, is rituals and designing rituals, meaningful rituals for these online environments. And I, in the q and I already see uh, Sylvain has a very good point. He makes a, his question around, um, shouldn't we kind of invent totally new things we, and instead of kind of try to copy paste what we do offline to online because we should invent basically new uh, and, and new interactions and new ways of doing things and that's exactly i think the challenge that we are uh, confronted with because we have no rituals and we have no kind of you know we're missing body language you're missing shaking hands and all that stuff so um that sort of one of the reasons why we're going to have a deep dive into rituals. Now, Ted uh, is uh, the chair of service design at uh, AHO, the Oslo School of Design and Architecture. Um, I've known Ted for a very long time. I've known he, that he's been working on rituals for a, almost like a decade, uh, I, I guess. So you are, uh, if there's one person who knows everything about the rituals and designing rituals in service design and meaningful rituals, uh, it, is, it is Ted. So I'm very proud to have you uh, with us. Uh, after Ted, so after Ted's talk, uh, not the Ted talk, but the Ted's talk, uh, we'll have, uh, I think that joke is going to, you, know, you must have had that joke before. <laughs> Sorry, Ted. Uh, we have, so next slide, please. We will have uh, uh, Emily. Um, and uh, Emily, uh, uh, I met Emily uh, at our design thinking conference last year, uh, and we had a really nice chat. And because I don't know, and this is Ted actually warned me for this a little bit because I said I know this this lady. She's a pastor. She's actually a design thinker and designer, but she's also a pastor. She must know so many many things or have so many points of view about rituals. And Ted did tell me like, yeah, but also be careful that. When you talk about rituals, often people kind of straight away start, start thinking about religion, and but it's way more than that. It's not just religion. So I think that's a really nice uh, uh, point of view, and I and I and I so I, I looked through a little bit through slides. I'm really excited to kind of have you with us. Um, also knowing the conversation we had at the uh, the conference. So anyway, so Emily, welcome as well. So these are our two speakers. Uh, but before. Uh, we have our speakers on. We're going to tease you a little bit, uh, a little bit more. So, because we're going to do a, a poll, and uh, so the first poll and Mark, uh, you uh, you take the lead on the poll because we have the first one. It's all about who is in the room because we kind of want to know who's in the room. So, Mark, uh, the first poll you're going to pull yes. up, and if if all is well, you can see the poll. So it depends a little bit on which. Uh, if you're, I think if you're on a phone. 
uh, you might not. Um, and I think that, but if you're on a, and if you watch on a browser, I think you're not seeing the poll. Uh, let us know if you're not seeing the poll right in the, in the chat. Yep. Uh, but if you are in the application, you yep. must be able to see the poll right now. So okay. first of all, your background. Go ahead, Mark. I can see the poll on my iPad, which is an attendee view. So you guys, should, right. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. If you haven't already started to respond to the poll, please answer this question. It's a little bit about your background. Now, this is kind of similar to what you would have if you came into a meeting. Um, you're kind of getting to know the people who's in the room. So that's kind of what we're looking for here. Um, we'll give you about 15 more seconds. Um, this poll has been open for 57 seconds. Now we'll go about 10 seconds after uh, the minute and then I'll end the poll and we'll see uh, the results. So some people, so Mark, so some people are saying they cannot vote and they can't sum, oh, submit. Yeah. Uh, so I, I see I, quite a lot of people actually who say they cannot submit. So um, why, is, why do you think that happens? Um, good question. If I put my, if I take the poll myself on my laptop. Um, so, and this is one of the reasons why we're doing this, right? So we're learning together how to kind of, uh, how to use this technology uh, or, you know, different kinds of technology and how to kind of uh, make it so that it's both entertaining and there's content rich and it's not too slow and it's not too fast. And it's, so it's, uh, and, and with the, you know, and it's interactive enough. And I think uh, uh, what we see nowadays, especially with this crisis is that technology that is awesome. I mean, it's amazing technology. I mean, I just read this article about what would have, what would have happened if this crisis happened in the eighties, right? When we had, <laughs> where we did not have like, we might have just maybe even crappy email. I can't even remember what we had in the eighties. I don't know how to communicate, how we communicated, but now we have this amazing technology, but we also see that it is sort of still kind of crappy, sort of. It's not, you know, it's not really there. So I think that, um, especially because we have all these different kind of platforms and uh, all these different kind of uh, devices that we use. So, so Arna, Mark, I think, I yeah. think um, we're just gonna close the poll. I'm not sure. I think some people who are joining, uh, our hypothesis is that people who are joining with just the uh, web browser uh, instead of downloading the Zoom app, may not have the poll feature. We'll check that for next time. So I'm going to close the poll now. And um, just to kind of uh, share the results with everybody, um, looks like we have the majority of folks are uh, considered to be in sort of the design thinking, uh, service design uh, field, which is cool because that's kind of who we, who we are. Um, and also, if you if you scroll up, you can see uh, most people are based in Europe and North America. We have uh, a uh, few people from Africa, Asia, and, and uh, South America. Uh, and then we have a majority, 63% of females and 35% of males and 2% prefer not to say. So that's who's in the room. Um, and I hey, think- Maybe yeah. I have an answer. So there's a, someone uh, uh, in the Q&A. So Oliver uh, and Martin uh, suggested that if you see sort of multiple questions, and you have to scroll down. Maybe so some maybe some people didn't see that there were multiple questions to answer, and you have to scroll down to actually submit. So might be the that might be the case. All right. Okay, I think I'm gonna we're gonna move right into the the uh, um, the speakers. Uh, yes. Arna, um, since we've gotten a um, a good idea of who's in the room, so I will hand it over to you, and then you can hand it over to Ted. Yes, thank you very much. So we've just uh, learned how to skip a part of a webinar because we feel that it's taking too long to get to the speakers, which is uh, which is great. Um, so um, uh, Ted, um, um, you're on next, and I kind of shortly introduce you uh, before uh, Mark starts his uh, his ten minutes uh, regime. Um, I, I, I would like to kind of uh, share just uh, that, like I already said, we've known each other for a very long time. I've known that you uh, worked at AHO uh, and uh, you're working at AHO and you've been working with the, uh, the football or soccer uh, community in Norway and you're a great uh, football lover. So, um, and I, and I, and I, I still, um, and I, I was thinking it's been such a long time that I've seen, but I'm really happy that, that you still have the hair. Um, and uh, but I'm I'm now I'm thinking 
we gave you a specific name and I forgot who, who the musician was we called you after. Morrissey, yes. It was you're a Morrissey lover. So Ted. I'm afraid, uh, afraid uh, I, I, I'm afraid since that time I've got a bit older. Uh, so it's not quite as Morrissey. And, and also I can't get my hair cut either, which is uh, all right. <laughs> really, really frustrating. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, so uh, please uh, go ahead and, uh, and tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, rituals and, uh, and your work and, uh, and, and what you um, and what you've been up to. Sure thing. Um, just to say uh, on that slide that's introducing me, it says I'm looking at rituals and secrets. Well, maybe looking at secrets. I don't know, but it's mostly actually rituals and the sacred. Uh, um, I'm so sorry. That no, was my right. no worries. That's my that's dyslexia. Cool. That's, that's my dyslexia. All right. And it's, um, it, go ahead. <laughs> but it, so so um, I think it's. I mean, I want to talk about rituals as best I can in ten minutes, and and also I want to talk about the work that I've been doing to give some people some context. Um, and, and of course, uh, rituals can be extraordinary, meaningful and powerful experiences. Um, and, and I noticed this. Could you have the next slide, please, um, Mark? Um, is that there's a, quite a lot of work in consumer culture theory that shows that people are having amazing sacred experiences through what they consume. And I got quite interested in that. I was quite fascinated by, to a certain extent, how could you design for that? Not just observe it, but how could you actually design for that? Could I have the next slide, please? Um, and, uh, and we see these like big consumer rituals happening, uh, like the opening of Apple stores, or these big rituals, and people having these, uh, what Durkheim would refer to as, as like a, a effervescent, collective effervescent experience, really highly charged, highly powerful. Um, and I was thinking, well, you know, how do I design that? How could I, you know, not just, you know, reverse engineer for these kind of experiences? And you'll see these kind of examples um, in, in people's adulation of rock stars, uh, you know, films, what, what have you. Um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of theory related to that. Could I have the next slide, please? So my, um, so my, 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 first thoughts really were, you know, what is the potential of rituals? And the more that I researched this, the, the more that I realized that uh, for rituals to work, you have to also really connect, could I have the next slide please, uh, quite deeply to some of the sort of broader social cultural spaces, um, ideas, uh, context that the rituals are performed within. So um, meaningful experiences, ritualized experiences also are driven by a community and their values. And in there, there are, you know, there's the use of symbols and myths and storytelling. And a lot of these are, are, are all performed in the rituals that, that groups of people perform together. Could I have the next slide, please? But what are, what are rituals indeed? Uh, and this we could discuss actually for a thousand hours. So um, anything I say now, if there's any anthropologists or sociologists, listening now they'll start going, what? How are you gonna talk about this in, in two seconds? But can I have the next slide, please? Um, of course, rituals are, are highly emotional, uh, they're highly charged, they're powerful, but also they can be quite small things as well. And uh, in, in, in certain ways, rituals can be also passageways. They can be transitions uh, between sort of large social movements or sort of uh, changing of status, but they can also be quite small things that you, you, you move through. They can be a ways to also alleviate anxieties and they're like, you know, performances that allow you to alleviate those stresses either on an everyday level or on a, a larger sort of existential level. Um, next slide, please. So, um, so on, on a micro level, I mean, uh, Goffman talks about these kind of everyday interaction rituals. And these are the, the, the all activity, all interaction is ritualized according to Goffman. So a handshake is a ritual. Uh, and for example, if we meet someone for the first time, it's a really great way to relieve the anxiety of going, how do I go? It's the transition from how do I go from I don't know you to I know you. Uh, and we perform a, a ritual, which is the handshake, at least in Western culture and other cultures we have. Uh, many different ways to do this and it just allows us to go from one state to the other we know how to act it's a, a performance Goffman argues that all 
all interactions are ritualized, even the way we talk to each other, the way we um, sort of maybe alleviate each other's anxieties at a dinner party, you burn the food and, and there's a ritualized response to that, oh, I've burnt the food, no, it was great, you know, so we, we perform these things all the time in all interactions. But also it can be these grander rites of passage, which Van Gennep writes about back in 1909, and, and there's these larger movements, say like uh, a wedding, for example, um, where we, it's a transition uh, in social status, uh, and, and, and um, can I have the next slide, please? What's interesting, a lot of theory suggests um, that m most rituals, or all rituals, uh, uh, some would suggest, have three phases, and that's separation, transition, and reincorporation. Um, the separ separation phase is about um, it's about leaving something behind. Transition is the kind of crazy bit in the middle, the changey part, the liminal space, which Turner re refers to. And then reincorporation, where you kind of brought back change. So the handshake, you know, you stick your hand out. That separates you from me not knowing you. You start shaking hands together and you reincorporate. You take your hand away. And now I know you. And we've made that transition. Um, but that's also the case with larger rites of passage, like a wedding. Can I have the next slide, please? So the, the wedding, for example, has a separation period, which could be... Um, the engagement in Western culture, you have uh, things like a stag party, a hen party, an engagement party, goodness knows. There's a transition phase, which is like the wedding day. Uh, and then also you have a reincorporation, which could be the, the, the marriage party afterwards. And through that, according to Collins and through other theorists' point of view, is these chains of rituals, smaller rituals that can, it carries the energy, like the stag party, like, um, like the, the wedding ceremony. And these ritualized clothing, ritualized action, these are small elements through the whole experience. Next slide, please. But all of this at the end is informed and understood through this kind of social cultural lens that we have and all this material that we use, you know, we can only read and understand them dependent on us having sort of this kind of social cultural or shared social cultural background uh, to, to, to understand and read the rituals that we have. Now, so obviously if we're talking about these digital spaces, what we find we don't actually have those at the moment, that doesn't actually uh, exist. Uh, and this is where we may be having to design them. And maybe the community we're looking at isn't just abroad. We are on this planet, so therefore we're in a community. Maybe it's also a community of designers or a community of, I don't know, digital freaks. I have no idea. But we have to, maybe we can draw material from that space. Could I have the next slide, please? So uh, just to kind of give an overview of the, the process, um, what this is very simplified by the way so what we're trying to do is we're trying to create customer journeys where we're understanding transitional phases in the customer experience in the service experience so you know in, in this case it could be the build-up to this digital uh webinar the transitional spaces in the webinar the close of the webinar and then afterwards what happens afterwards so those are transitional spaces then we're doing some form of cultural scoping and mapping. So we're trying to understand what's the cultural material we've got to work with. What's the anxieties that we find? What are the stories that we tell about ourselves? Because these myths are really these metaphors about who we think we are. We're trying to make meaning out of that and, and sort of reduce that into, or make a concentrate of that into a service with myth, which is a, a form of narrative about the context of the, the, the service experience that we're going to design for. And then we're designing a ritual service journey, which is, uh, which is full of these meaningful service encounters, which are like a chain of, of interactions. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, this is something we've done with banking, we've done it with tourism, we've done it with telecoms. And, but one of the biggest projects that we've worked with is the Norwegian Football Association, the Norwegian Premier League. I've also worked with a, a large international football organization, which will remain nameless. And, um, and basically what we're looking at here is to try and apply this method into the football space. Now, most people would say football is already a ritual, um, but in fact, um, the truth is that because of big business money, that has that ritualistic, that sacredness of football has reduced somewhat. So following the method, what we did, next slide, please. Um, so what we did, we, we, um, we, we map out the current customer experience. We look for transitional spaces. Next slide, please. And the next slide after that one, please. And we're looking for all this cultural material and we're trying to read and understand what it's saying about the nation. Again, what's the mythology? What's the stories that we say about ourselves? Who do we think we are as a community? Next slide, please. Um, 
and then we try and marry together the current sort of typical customer journey of before, during, and after. Next slide, please. Uh, with a with a ritual sort of service structure. Next slide, please. Uh, to create a, a, a sort of a grand ritual relating to football. So Act One and Act Five are kind of like the before and after of a customer journey. Act two and act four are separation and reincorporation. And act three is the core of the experience, which is, which is the football match. And, and this whole sort of uh, ritualized uh, journey is then populated with, um, with smaller meaningful service uh, encounters through for both players and for, for fans as well. So if I can, if I can, uh, Go to the next slide. I can give you one example. There's like I could give you maybe 50 examples from what we've done at, at a national football game in Norway. So, for example, before the game starts, uh, next slide, please. Uh, what would used to happen uh, is that the the player was called up to play for their country. They would get an email, and it basically said, "Dear Martin, could you play for your country in a few weeks' time? Uh, all the best. We've spoken to your agent. Blah blah blah." And we we felt that you know that's not that doesn't deliver anything meaningful it doesn't punctuate the time it doesn't make any transition from not playing for your country to playing for your country so we redesigned this experience next slide please um, as a micro ritual that that uses the sort of gifting rituals as a way to engage emotionally the player next okay there's a slide yes so um been using fantastic cartoonists to try and uh, explain the experience to other people but here is the the new experience you know we we created boxes and we designed uh, an experience for the player that would lift the meaning of being called up for your country next slide please um so so here we see what the final designs are like and i say this is just one small micro ritual in a larger ritual structure and again uh Nice box with the shirt in it, uh, some some uh, lovely moleskin with the sort of the country logo and the, these different parts, and also uh, storytelling. And this 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 micro ritual has been taken up by quite a lot of football associations around the world as a way to sort of build meaning in this sort of what is sometimes quite a mundane journey for the players. And we've done a lot for the fans as well. Next slide, please. So um, yeah. It looks like there's a film there. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, if you could go there, we need to drop drop the film. That's not so important. So you can find a a a, a rough uh, description of the method in chapter nine of this book, which came out last year. Um, next slide, please. And there's also a, a more complex description of the uh, of the method in this journal here. Um, if we can take the next slide, please. So really, that's it for me. I, I think I think what we need to do is then to discuss. Uh, I don't know how long have I got, guys. Um, I can't. I haven't heard a bell. You're you're you're, uh, you're at time. Uh, oh great! All right then. I didn't hear any bell. Shall I stop there then? I mean, I think the the point then going forward is to say if we if we if we look about if we look at a, a, the digital experience for for meetings, then we need to try and map out where are those transitional points before, during, and after, and can we add those micro rituals and, and do we design them together and what can we draw from from our community who are sharing this space to actually create value and also alleviate anxiety about how we use this technology thank you that's it yeah. Yeah, we want to hear the bell mark we want to hear the bell yeah i want to hear the bell as well we want to hear the bell man Okay. Hear that? I think I think your presentation was so riveting that he lost track of time i forgot to uh engage yeah. the bells so what happened was i i you know this is there's there's a bunch of things going on uh we've had a couple of people suggest that we obviously i mean it would be great if we could give the presenters the control so they don't have to say next slide please and 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 absolutely that is what we're going to shoot for next time um we we we've gone with this method for right now um and i was on mute when i when i was doing the sounds which is stupid so i have to remember now to unmute myself to do the sounds i apologize ted you did a great job um right. and and arna uh yes. just real quick with emily just give her a tee up yeah absolutely so uh, thank you very much ted so um uh, we're gonna move uh, to our next next speaker emily um and i 
I uh, and we're going to have some a little bit more time with you, Ted, um, um, to sort of um, go a little deeper into uh, a few of the topics that you raised uh, after uh, uh, and together with Emily and after Emily's talk. Um, there, so check out the Q and A. So people, if you're using the Q and A. Uh, to kind of ask questions, please do so, right? So those were, uh, we're gonna, uh, I mean, we're gonna address those questions uh, after Emily's talk and also during Emily's talk. So you know, obviously use the Q&A to, uh, to ask questions. So uh, next uh, speakers, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ted. Uh, I, I have lots of questions for you. Um, uh, so, but um, Emily, uh, please go ahead. Um, I'm very happy to have you here. And uh, so Mark, please go and, uh, Food, uh, okay, uh, Emily, over to you. Okay, um, so hi everyone. Uh, I, what I, as um, Arne mentioned earlier, he and I met at the Design Thinkers Conference this past fall, and um, it was really an interesting experience for me because people were like, you're a pastor, why are you here? Um, which was a wonderful opportunity for me to kind of really think about why am I there? Um, my background is in graphic design, and um, I uh, am part of a church that is about 10 years old. Um, I planted one of four locations um, that we have throughout Chicago um, on the, I planted the South Side location and now I'm sort of overseeing all of the sites. But um, what I found was that in my planting work um, and starting the church, I drew a lot from my, the theories and the kind of um, mindset and frameworks and, and problem solving that I learned through um, graphic design and design thinking and iterating and experimenting um, as I tried to kind of create um, what I would describe as an empathetic human community that's rooted in a deep narrative that calls people to purpose in this world. Um, so for me, those conversations or those sort of ways of thinking um, really were complementary for my particular work. Um, and so uh, what a lot of what we have done, we have folks who come from all kinds of different backgrounds, Catholic, non-denominational, Pentecostal, um, agnostic, um, who are really drawn to both um, the values that we have, but also the ways that we try to create spaces for meaning making um, and drawing from the rituals that um, feel very familiar to folks from different spaces um, within that kind of fall underneath the kind of Christian um, umbrella. And so there will be some things often that folks who come in and say, oh, that looks, that's a very familiar ritual um, for me. And other folks who say like, I don't, you know, I don't think that that's okay. Or like, you know, folks who did not come from maybe a Catholic or Orthodox background, seeing folks lighting candles um, sounds or feels very strange to them. And so we um, often um, both kind of incorporate rituals that are very familiar to folks, but then also invite people into rituals that may deepen their understanding of the tradition or, or the faith um, uh, that are new for them. And so, um, you know, one of our rituals is that, you know, to kind of um, create space for people to think differently about, you know, if I light a candle before a picture, um, is that a picture, um, a kind of classic icon, or is that a picture of um, Mary and uh, baby Jesus um, fleeing um, uh, uh, hostile governments? Um, is this uh, passing of the peace, uh, shaking hands and kind of reminding one another that we have access to peace? Um, is that, uh, how do we, ha how do we do that now in a time when, uh, when we can't touch each other and we have to respect social distancing? Um, and so, uh, if you could head to the next slide, we've kind of particularly in this moment of our, um, time together, um, have, uh, always kind of, uh, had to reimagine or have had to reimagine what, um, what a lot of our rituals, uh, uh, contain. Um, but one of the, the kind of key pieces or key kind of principles that, that, regularly um, kind of help drive or, or sort of serve as a kind of plumb line um, for us as we think about, is, does this make sense or is this sort of, is this more um, fun or is it, does it have meaning? Um, uh, is this kind of think about a lot of these um, aspects um, that I've kind of listed out here, um, that rituals can form um, as a function of, or can function as, as a form of um, identity formation. So like we're the kind of people who do this or who value this um, uh, as opposed to whatever else. Um, uh, it it's functions as, as a practice of culture building. So we value these kinds of things. Um, uh, it builds connection. Um, so we build relationships in these ways um, uh, and we're connect and we, see ourselves as being connected to others. Um, and then of course, meaning making, um, which is uh, a big part of uh, religious traditions is we do this and it matters because of this. 
Um, I think that these kind of general sort of, I tried to pull them out at sort of a 30,000 foot or maybe a 15,000 foot level to kind of make them applicable in a diversity of different kinds of settings um, and across different teams um, that, uh, to, that it might be helpful to sort of think about those um, four kind of anchor points as you think about, well, what rituals might have meaning for us or communicate uh, um, who we are, not only to others, but to ourselves as a kind of reminder, which is a lot of what kind of church liturgies often do or religious liturgies do. We are these kinds of people, and this is the way that we kind of enter into, um, as Ted kind of mentioned, these transitional spaces where we're once again reminded, reminded or reacquainted um, with uh, the things that uh, that shape who we are who we, or who we want to be. Um, and so as I was kind of mentioning earlier, um, we've had to sort of reimagine what some of those would look like in an online format um, as we practice social distancing and take care of one another in that way. Um, so I thought I would share um, a couple of uh, um, uh, examples of that if you could head to the next slide, Mark. Um, one is uh, if you're is communion. So if you if you uh, are familiar with the Christian tradition, you'll know that communion um, is a is a is a table um, ritual uh, where folks are reminded of lots of different things. Different traditions kind of um, emphasize different aspects, but one of them is just a reminder of when um, when Jesus, the the kind of the one who um, Christians uh, sort of see as um, following um, in our tradition. Um, uh, gathered with his friends to share a meal. And the ways that we understand um, communion, one of the kind of primary ways is that it's a meal that has been shared across space and time, across generations of people um, that reminds us that we are not just who we are today, but we are actually people who are tied to those who came before us. And, and there will be people um, who come after us who, who we all are also tied to that we don't know. Um, and so as we think about what does it mean to do communion, in fact, not in the same place, but separate from one another. Um, it's been really interesting to um, help help the community kind of think about that themselves. We had folks who were sort of, when we were streaming our service, um, you know, they would say, oh, I'm, I've got a coffee and a donut. You know, we were just sort of like, get a starch and a liquid and we'll kind of figure it out. Some people said, oh, I have Oreos and milk. You know, Jesus never tasted so good. Um, so just kind of fun ways for people to both think about what, what it, what are the things that um, that that matter about this meal in this moment, and what are the things that are sort of negligible? Does it really need to be bread and wine or bread and juice, um, or is the point, the purpose of the ritual, a reminder that we are in this together, that we are here as a as a community that perhaps is physically distant but spiritually close, um, and to share that meal at the same time, to even share these are the elements that I decided to use in order to have that meal. Um, uh, was just a really fun and kind of reimagining for folks and also without losing the meaning of what it meant for the community. If you could head to the next um, slide. Uh, this past Sunday um, for the Christian tradition was um, uh, is called was called Palm Sunday, which is a, a Sunday when we um, remember um, uh, uh, kind of the, the beginning of a political uprising um, in a lot of ways for um, for Jesus as a po popular and political figure in his time who um, was uh, what a lot of Americans would probably say were socialists. Um, uh, but uh, this kind of ritual um, is a reminder of um, the hope of the people um, at the time. And they would wave palms um, together. And in a lot of churches, um, there are palms that, you know, you, you go on Palm Sunday and then you're given palms and everyone sort of waves and sings a song. Well, we couldn't do that together. So we invited folks to make homemade palms and then kind of wave, you know, take a video of them waving them for um, a few seconds to to then stitch it together into one video. And what was really great was when we showed it this past Sunday to the community again during our streaming service, people were talking about how touched that they were, not only for the ritual itself, but again, for being able to see people in the community who were also doing the same thing to observe and remember this, um, uh, uh, this ritual. Um, the last thing I wanted to sort of share was that um, as our t as a team and as a staff, one of the things that we do that's a ritual, um, if you could head to the next slide, Mark, um, is we do a kind of a, a reflection at the beginning of our meeting. Um, and often um, that, that might be something that's like explicitly religious um, uh, or explicitly tied to the tradition, or it could be a poem um, uh, or kind of a reflection um, like what, what's displayed here. Um, or a song. Um, and so the, what it does is kind of 
both gather us in and sort of settle us into our meeting, um, but also it helps us kind of serve to remind us of some of those four um, values um, or four uh, uh, modes of shaping our identity and, and meaning making for us. So if you could head to the next slide, Mark. Um, for as I think of, as I sort of have something to offer to you all, um, I'd invite you to think about um, what might a ritual for online gathering be for you? Now, you know, as a pastor um, in a religious space, I kind of tend to go deep really quickly. And so you can sort of like, if you're like, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're not that deep, right? Like, or we don't want to go that close. Um, you can sort of decide um, how deep or, or, or not deep that you want to be in your rituals. But one way that you can do is sort of take a practice that your team is familiar with and reinvent it for an online format. So Arne talked about sort of the decompression zone and um, when, you know, people would like, oh, go grab a cup of coffee, hang up your coat, you know, like get yourself settled in. Perhaps there is something that your team um, or your uh, organization does um, to sort of kick off your meetings in that way that you could sort of replicate. Um, others could be creating new ones that sort of gather hearts and minds that build connections. So it could be, you know, sort of reading a poem together or listening to a song together and then reflecting on, you know, what's one thing that um, had meaning for me, if that feels a little bit too um, intimate. Uh, another example could be sort of doing a little bit of quick sharing around a good sort of um, uh, matrix would be like health, thanks, and wow, and everyone around the table could share maybe one thing out of that, but each of those categories or just one of those categories they want to say, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling like I need help with this, or, you know, I'm feeling gratitude or giving thanks for this, or I'm really amazed and feeling wowed by this thing that happened this past week, just as a way, again, to kind of do because you can't, um, Arne talked about, um, or no, I think this was earlier, but talk about like it's really hard to read body language um, over video when you're just sort of seeing people, you know, from the chest up. Um, and so that's a way to just kind of invite people to share like what's going on within them um, uh, at this moment as we're gathering in this space. Um, celebration of failures, that's very um, common, I think, in, in iterative um, organizations um, and design thinking organizations where you say, hey, this is, the, this is the failure I want to celebrate this past week, and this is the thing that I learned from it. Um, and what that can do for a culture is say, um, is help people feel like, you know, um, I don't have to feel ashamed of my failures, but in fact, let's celebrate what's the best failure I had this past week um, as a way to both sort of say, ours is the kind of culture that says, we um, celebrate uh, the things that we can learn from one another um, and, and then try to do, try to think um, differently for the next go around. Um, or finally, kind of similarly sharing victories and defeats, um, perhaps in, in your personal life or in, um, in your work, whatever makes sense for the culture of your team. Um, so those are, that's pretty much it um, in terms of uh, what I thought might be helpful and meaningful for you all. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. We're applauding in silence, I think. Um, <laughs> one of those little rituals that, that are difficult to kind of uh, either replicate or we also have to reinvent how to say thank you uh, um, when there's an audience there as you cannot see or hear. Um, thank you very much. So um, for again, uh, so I see a lot of questions uh, popping up. So that's wonderful. So um, I would um, invite Ted, uh, because I think there's a question um, that you've marked as I'm going to answer online in the q and I guess. If not, I, I, I will have a question for you. So Emily, can you see the Q&A? Right, so yes. maybe take some, take a little, take a moment to kind of go through it, and I, I will start asking Ted uh, a, a question because I, I really want to know kind of your kind of first um, uh, kind of uh, thought. You, you, you know, you, you work at a school, you have students, you know, uh, you know, now everyone's home. Uh, you know, we we are kind of uh, thrown into this kind of new, uh, uh, new world where we have to do things virtual. We have to do things through Zoom and these video conferencing. Are there any rituals, any things like these transition zones that you talked about? What kind? What what are transition zones in these kind of meetups? So, do you have any any thoughts about that? Well, and, and not, not tremendously. I, I think what's interesting is how. And it's the same as when you and I spoke yesterday, Arne, is that we still need to have these ways to move into a conversation. And, and of course, when they're not physical, uh, it's also slightly strange when you don't actually have that way to sort of negotiate both the physical space, but also just the verbal space. So then what, what is happening is that there's those same kind of 
of uh, performances that we're going through to make sure everyone's all right. And what's interesting in Britain, uh, we've always had the ritual of the weather to discuss, uh, but now we have the ritual of coronavirus to have a discussion around. So, so in a kind of strange way, we 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 quickly do find ways to ritualize our behaviour because we're very very naked without it. So now I do find just one of the rituals that we seem to start off with is how are you feeling and then your friends okay how are your family and again this is actually according to Goffman ritualized behavior uh, and and one of the questions was I, I, I can't remember exactly how it was coined but it was about um, how you know how do you actually instigate um, these rituals in a digital space and I, I think I think what's interesting is that we we as as humans as animals I mean animals have ritualized behavior but as humans we desperately need rituals so when there's a necessity, we, we, we jump on them very, very quickly. And we only need something that's actually a bit of a suggestion of a ritual, and we'll, we'll actually use it if we think it's useful for us. Um, um, I, don't let me go off on a tangent, but we do see people have tried to instigate rituals when they're not needed. Hobsbawm writes a whole book about um, how the British Empire created rituals around pomp and circumstance. But it took a long time for people to actually uh, take them on board. In these times where we're desperately crying out for them, I think we quickly start to do them. And I can yeah. see already you're making rituals as part of your, your webinar. Yeah. And this is only yeah. the third one. Well, so to your point, I think what you what you are saying is that we 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 are naturally inclined to kind of create these. So so there might be sort of you know this this now we kind of feel that we need to create these rituals, but they will also kind of emerge. So so it's also about to kind of the, in this webinar for instance i already felt a few things that i thought okay actually this is nice that isn't less okay we have to kind of do do their thing differently so emily i have a question to you uh i something i really wanted to ask you um i'm not sure if i'm addressing one of the questions in the q a uh but i i maybe i am but what are sort of the um i wrote it down here so after this crisis is over and you can go back uh to the physical meetups what are the things that you can keep? Do you think, or are there things you, you will be able to keep? Uh, or is it just kind of, you know, for, for, for the crisis uh, or, or is there more? Yeah, our staff is actually talking about that right now, trying to think, realizing that there are a lot of folks who have moved away, who have come back to be part of the community as a result of the accessibility of it. Um, and, uh, you know, the Never, never waste a good crisis, right, for an opportunity to try to think about uh, introducing new ways of, of doing what you've been doing before. Um, so uh, I, I don't have any concrete answers at this point, but we're kind of actively sort of thinking about th this is clearly sort of, at least for us and our work, um, like opened up new dimensions of connecting with folks um, who, for a variety of reasons, may be disconnected or, or kind of disengaged. Um, and so we're actively thinking about that. Um, but one question that someone asked that I thought was really important was um, Beatrice had asked it, how do you mo motivate people to share failure? Um, I often, in my work, um, I often, so it, when you're trying to sort of engage people in a more vulnerable and deeper way, um, what I often do is I, I'm the first one to go, right? Like I'm the first one who shares the kind of harder thing, um, which I think can uh, can set the tone. So whoever it is that's the person with the greatest amount of power in the room, um, uh, they need to be the one to share a failure and 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 then talk about um, what it was that they learned from it and and um, and share that. And that makes immediately does a does a good amount of work to make the space feel a little bit more like it's okay to share failures. You know, people have their own sort of other things that, that kind of keep them from, from being um, willing to share. But if the person with the most power in the room shares failure, um, that really kind of alleviates um, the risk factor, I think, for a lot of folks around the um, well, table. So uh, and I'm conscious of time because we promised that we will stop at six and we're going to stop at six. Uh, that's part of our ritual. We have to keep time. That's one thing that we've invented. Mark, you wanted to say something. Yeah, just real quick. Um, yes. And and I have a question for I wanted to ask. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we we are going to keep on. We are going to stay online for a ritual that we stumbled upon last week, which was um, inviting you to come backstage. So we're going to hang out for another half an hour after the hour for more discussion. But 
um, just to let people yeah. know that that's going to yeah. happen. But we're going to cut off the official program at the top of the hour. So last, so so question I want to ask uh, Ted is. Um, 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 uh, because it's one of the questions in the Q&A, it's about culture and rituals. So what is the connection between culture and rituals? Oh, uh, well, I mean, that, that's, that we could spend an hour answering that. Uh, I mean, I think <laughs> yeah, that, one uh, minute. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, rituals are often expressions of culture and they often condense a lot of this cultural material in their performance. But of course, um, like design, you know, rituals create culture. So to a certain extent, rituals, well, the, the expression of a community through ritual can often control and, and, and move and, and uh, I'm now thinking of Foucault, but I mean, certainly there can be, there can be ways to control culture and control communities. Um, I'm losing my point here. But, but of course, there is that flow between creating culture and, and, and also being an expression of culture. And through the performance of rituals, people strengthen their sense of identity, but they also express their sense of identity through rituals. So this is, this, you know, I mean, Durkheim talks about it, but there's this like this constant spiral of, of building your emotion and your connection to each other whilst also expressing it. Emily, you wanted to respond to this? Yeah, I was just going to say, also, I think rituals can serve to be um, an aspirational kind of reminder of who we want to be. Um, so the work that we do, um, one of our commitments is, is to be an anti-racist community. Um, and we are in many ways continuing to fail at that. Um, but we always sort of keep that front of mind to say, this is a whole other thing, but sort of there are kind of four transforming values that we work from and we remind each other, are we, are we really doing that? Or does this really reflect that value? And um, it, it, that sort of shifts, it's not exactly ritual, but rituals can serve, I think, also to say, I am not this yet, but I hope to be that. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, not only affirming where we are currently, but also where we wanna be. Awesome, thank you very much. So um, we all have two minutes to go before we let everyone go off to uh, their lives again. Um, I hope uh, this uh, this introduction introduction of this theme, or uh, at least to me, it was you know this whole this idea of of, of uh, rituals. I think it's an extremely powerful lens to look at the things you do and to look at the things, how you design your online experiences and what are the things that, so the transition zones and how to create community and belonging and how to do that and to do that purposely. And I think we have to learn to do these things online because we haven't, it's like this open space. We still, ha we have to fill in. So it's an amazing opportunity. So uh, next week, Wednesday, what we'll be doing is we're going to have uh, a more a, a work session on ritual so if uh, we're so you're all invited to come over to uh to us uh, on the next wednesday uh, web jam and to kind of think about you know what kind of rituals you actually can are already using or which one are you can uh, you can design and we can go and do more of a, of a co-creation session on uh, next week so um because of time um uh i'm going to uh say goodbye uh, I'm going to thank uh, Emily and Ted uh, for your 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 awesome talk and your uh, inspiring us. You are both on LinkedIn, and I know you can be tracked online. So if uh, I hope uh, so, don't, so um, uh, if you want to, I'm pretty sure uh, you'll be willing to answer maybe a few questions. Um, we are going to say goodbye to both of you, and we're going to say goodbye to anyone who wants to leave at the top of the hour. And uh, we are going to uh, stay on for another 30 minutes uh, um, uh, because that's basically our, our backstage. Um, the official program ends. We have this ritual, it's like we call it backstage, is like, you know, and that's where you are right now. So goodbye to anyone who wants to go. Uh, thank you very much. I hope we inspired you. And, uh, and that's, oh, we're kind of off the air, so to speak, but not. So thank you. So. <laughs> Ted, I know there are so many things in your head. You're like, ah, damn it, I wanted to say these things and I didn't say these things. So is there no, no, one it's, thing? It's, it's just, it, I mean, it's just what you were saying, Emily, about, um, about this aspirational stuff. And, and if there, there is this highly problematic, especially in large rituals like football matches, for example, because of course, you, you, this, this terrifying idea of like mass suggestion and obviously rituals have been used by totalitarian regimes in the past to, to pro propagate really quite terrifying ideas. 
but also that they can be used to propagate really powerful and good ideas. And that's been also the point within football is to look at some, say, for example, uh, around gender equality, uh, uh, around how we uh, sort of become more aware of people's sexual orientation and, and, and in the football stadium and actually celebrate that and actually creating rituals that we could could actually connect to those issues and like you say those become aspirational but of course the moment you talk about rituals on these grand scales everyone thinks of course of albert speer and and, and about lenin <laughs> oh, sorry about stalin uh, and 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 it is like a, this thing it's a force for good it's a force for evil but it's how we choose to use them hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Emily, anything you, you how is the how is this format for you? Because it, to us, it's it's like I'm like I'm to my mind you're like, you know, I have to you know I have to stop. We're we're almost always like we start <laughs> at right, the moment we start, we're actually mm -hmm. thinking about stopping. We're like it's just an hour. It's just yeah, yeah. It's just a minute, and we couldn't hear Mark, and we we're like on on WhatsApp, ch you know, chatting with each other. I didn't hear your bell. Where was your bell? Oh damn it! I was a minute. <laughs> So, so how is it? It was there. Nobody heard it. I was just like, damn. <laughs> so tell me, how was that? I was that for you to be sort of on like a panelist and you know just get this ten minutes and then even just Q and A's. You're like really brief. I think I think mm -hmm. we spent too much time in the beginning just introducing the whole thing. To be honest, but mm -hmm. so tell me, mm -hmm. what was your feeling? Um, I mean, I really enjoyed it because um, I'm often in pe like circles of people who think generally speak the same language as me um, these you know since I've been in, in ministry and so I really love like it's exciting for me to think about how do I talk about what we do um, in a way that's I don't want to say dispassionate because it's not like that I don't care but in a way that's a little bit um, sort of let me examine this from the outside and um, you know not divorcing not sort of being I don't feel apologetic for kind of my own um, religious tradition or anything but how do I help people kind of not let that get in the way of understanding the 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 vehicle or the shape that it takes and why why it matters and why it makes a difference why would that um, get in so the way fun. why it's interesting you said that why do you feel that it would get in, in the way um, I mean, so the, the kind of church that I plant has a lot of people who have been sort of burned or bored by religion. And so they come in often with uh, waiting for sort of the other shoe to drop, like, oh, this is going to be, these people are going to be kind of like what Ted was talking, like the, the sort of uh, the worst version of the ways that rituals can be used, right? And that they've been maybe experienced certain kinds of spiritual abuse or, or been told that there are things about them that are not acceptable or that they should be ashamed of. And so, um, so I often um, assume uh, that, that church or religion is going to feel a little bit like off-putting to people um, and could be a barrier for them to really in enter into um, a deeper kind of meaningful conversation. I do think though my sense was that when I was at the um, conference, uh, I think Europe is in a different place or Europeans are in a different place than, um, than Americans are. So mm -hmm. um, Oh. Yeah, I, and I could be wrong about that, but um, I mean, like the the kind of conservative Christian um, kind of rhetoric, the very extreme conservative Christian rhetoric that often gets lifted up in the kind of political spaces in particular um, is what what I think most Americans tend to sort of then sort of paint most Christians with. Um, whereas my sense about Europeans is that there is a much kind of longer history that sort of has a... Um, doesn't quite have the same uh, level of, uh, of heightened energy um, and um, rejection, you but know, you know, I, maybe I haven't spent enough time in Europe. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 it's just that, no, I think you're right. You don't have to be a Christian to become prime minister, for instance, there's no, that's not really, mm -hmm. that's not part of the, your resume. That doesn't have to be at all. It doesn't have to yeah. be top. Um, so, so I think that's, uh, it, so the, I think, the, I think the religion and uh, politics are more detached in a way, so it's mm -hmm. not like it's not. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, you guys worked That's it out like 500 years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Anyway, any, any, uh, any. Uh, so, Ted, what was your feeling uh, with this format? It's because it's it's really it's really brief, right? It's very short. Um, yeah, I think I think it's I I, I think it's. Um, I, I want to try and answer people's questions. And then there's this thing, I'm trying to listen to Emily, I'm trying to listen to, read the questions, I'm trying to answer. Yeah. And so there's obviously these, these things where you, you feel you want to 
talk to people, really do want to give people answers. I would say just generally in the format, I think we took a bit too long time to get into yeah. the, the, the yeah, session. Agree. And uh, and uh, I think I think it was only like 20 past, 25 past before we even got yeah. going. And I yeah. think that time would have been much better used with a with conversation. I think, you know, it would be really nice to to have the time to chat around these issues. So Absolutely. I think the, I think that the onboarding part needs to go boom uh, and then we're off. And I think, I think it was, I think there are some uh, interesting aspects in terms of say, find out where everyone's from, find out what everyone does. It's a classic. If yeah, I mean, I'm, somebody asked this question about uh, rituals earlier about whether, you know, is it as sincere as a ritual? I think rituals can be sincere, even if they are, how are you? I still think they can be quite sincere question, even if it's ritualized uh, behavior. But there's this degree of ritualized behavior in where, what, what's your name? What do you do? Where do you come from? I mean, it's like, it's like a format. We need to know who we're dealing with here. So that makes a lot of sense, find out where everyone's from, what we're going to do. And there's, uh, obviously there's a thing of the rules of the room, but I think we need to move really quickly. I think we should be talking by 10 yeah. past. So then we've got a whole half hour to... to yeah, it's know. interesting. Yeah, it, it, it somehow time moves differently in, the, in a different speed when you're online. Things that usually wouldn't be like 20 minutes in an offline meeting, like, uh, you know, getting getting like uh, who's in the room and getting... I mean, that's real. that feels so different than to an online meeting. People get really impatient really quickly. So it's about, you know, if, if, if you're not getting to the meat of the program in like, you know, 10 minutes or so, people are getting like, oh, it's already 10 minutes. They're like... It's just ten minutes. What you, have you? Do you have anything else to do? I mean, we're in a lockdown. What are you talking about? But but it's no. But, but I feel it too. I feel it. I feel it. I feel like I feel as a sort of you know. You feel like you know. This is taking. So why is this taking so long? And we skipped a part. Like how how did we? Because we did a. We talked through it. But time moves different online. So but we need these transitions. So to your point, Ted, earlier, your the transition spaces. So. And who's in the room it's, it's some of those things you know you want to kind of have an icebreaker you want to play so but there are there are too many things but so what is the meaningful start so we can create community we can create connection there is a you because i'm missing human connection a lot um so how do you how do we you know and i'm not saying we have to kind of reinvent it like to one or two to, to one of the participants point like you can't just copy paste no you can't copy paste it you have to reinvent it. It has to be done different. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm really struggling with this. Like, how, how do I make it fun, entertaining, nice, human? How do I create this connection? How can we smile and laugh together? Because to me, laughter is such an important tool I use in in, in sessions. That I need people. I need to hear them laugh. Uh, so I'll make a joke because it sort of make, gives me kind of sense of the room and the mood and who's there and if we understand each other. It, it's a connector. To me, and I, I'm like, so I'm like, I'm like, I'm almost like this weird presenter that I'm not because I can't do that. I'm not that kind of. So, I'm really, uh, yeah, Mark, please go ahead. Um, so, there's it, it, it's such a strange, it's kind of like being in a different world in a way, right? Because we're we're sensory beings, right? And we we rely on a lot of things in the physical world that we're not conscious that we're relying on, right? Signals from other people and and uh, cues that are both in the physical environment that are inanimate and and uh, you know the obvious things are the signage, both um, uh, both. Uh, um, metaphorical and 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 actual signage, you know, th those kind of things that that are the signposts for how we interact and collaborate together. And they're completely different in this world. And like, I really love your point, Ted, about like just get started. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Something about me, I'm an engineer, and I get into the freaking details. And and it's like we're all in this crew trying to figure out how do we do this and how do we time it. And we we went through the timing like. 10 times and it still just from the get-go was off the rails to, not by much but like two three minutes here when we're talking about me ringing a bell that I couldn't ring because I was on mute and then when I was off mute all this other kind of stuff it's like the, the then we have the polling issue right and and uh you know so how do we set the the environment up so that we can engage an audience and, and we make it pretty, we're trying to make it really clear that this is a webinar 
which is broadcast. We're doing a meeting next week, which is 100 people and everybody can interact. You see all the faces on the screen. How do you do this webinar thing? Or do we even bother doing a webinar thing um, where uh, we have to make sure that we have to assume nobody's ever been in here before, right? Mm -hmm. So that we give them enough uh, maybe we need to send them an email ahead of time that says, here's your cheat sheet yeah. for your work, you know, and that would say. Diana, yeah. Diana actually said, you know, I think you could send the rules um, and webinar logistics in the invitation mail or mail. Um, yeah. So that might be helpful. It is hard because like some people are really familiar with using Zoom and some people it's like their first time and they're not quite sure how to, you know, so you're, there's a little bit of like on ramping that you're doing every time. But I think that that might be a, a good solution to that. Also, possibly you could do the poll in the, um, uh, in the decompression zone. So like, welcome to the decompression zone. Let us know where you're from. You know, that might be a way to cut something out. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree with that. Oh, sorry, I can't see you, Steve. Sorry, I jumped in front of you. Oh, I just wanted to ask Mark, is there a way for you to unmute participants? Because some of them would like to Ask yeah, questions. we can do that. I can go through and make everybody a panelist. Do you want me to do yeah, that? Do that now. Okay. Everyone who's left, make yeah, everyone who's, who is left at, at, in the uh, backstage. We should have everyone on backstage. You just can jump in. I'm going to do that one by one. <laughs> well, I can't. There's no way to do it uh, as a group. So uh, you have to do one by one. Well, it's it's Henderson. Okay. There's still uh, quite a few people left. So. Uh, no, what, what I was going to say was in, in regards to sort of introducing yeah. the rituals into these spaces, I, it was the funny thing about rituals, we like to believe that they're not invented, that they are somehow, they come out of the ether and they, they, that it's very organic and they suddenly appear. But somebody usually has invented a, 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 a ritual at some point. I think the, the thing is, it's about whether people are happy with them or feel comfortable with them or whether they're needed and whether people feel uh, that it's theirs, that they own it. And I think, you know, you've done this three or four times and maybe this is the point that you say, this is how we, we do this and, and this is how the community does this uh, and, and be introducing those things obviously that work and, you know, weed out the things that don't. But I think it's, again, it's about introducing people to say these, these are the kind of things we do here uh, and you're setting that as your kind of, again, back to this whole question about culture. Uh, these, these are the values we have. These are the things that we do. And we want you to take part in that um, as a way to sort of decide what those things actually are. And we say, you can say we've done this by trial and error, um, but these are what we do. And it's the bell or a gong or the 10 minutes in, now we're starting. This is what we do here. And maybe, Annelie, you've you've experienced this at your congregation, this is what we do here. And you're invited to be part of these things that we do. It's the same at the football. These are things that we do here. And we really want you to do them with us. And we find ways to teach you how to do them if it's your first sure. time. And we, we build pride in those people who know how to do them. Mm -hmm. So is there, well, oh, sorry, Emily, go ahead, Emily. No, go ahead, Ernie. No, no, no. Okay, so, uh, well, it's interesting that you, when you were talking to him, it just kind of made me realize that one of the things that we do um, every every Sunday morning um, is we sort of say our values, we say we're bold, we're inclusive and relevant, and this is what that means. And um, because there's always new people who come in who are like, well, I heard about this church, let me check it out. Um, and what I like about it, um, almost everyone who's been there for a long time has it like memorized. When people say, oh, tell me about your church, I overhear them say, oh, we're both inclusive and relevant, and then they kind of go through. Um, but what I like about it is it actually like sets some ground rules. So when we say like, we talk about like, well, we're inclusive. And so that whether you're gay or you're straight or you're not quite sure, um, there is a place for you. And like automatically what that communicates to people in the room is like, this is who this space is for. And you don't have to agree with it, but we have said who this space is for. Um, and it kind of um, reinforces a certain set of values around where our commitments are and who is welcome. Um, so that it's, it's communicated very explicitly um, and there's no question ab about, about some of those pieces that, that might be a question for some folks. Um, whereas other pieces are much more, I think, for example, like the, the, um, the cowbell and the car horn, people will catch on. At the first time, the first speaker, they might be a little be surprised, like, what does that mean? But by the second speaker, they'll realize, like, oh, it's attached to some kind of timing, right? Um, so not even needing to, some rituals you sort of absorb, you absorb because you've been, you're among the people and you kind of begin to realize like, oh, this is 
this is what you do. I don't, I don't greet people doing this in, in the U S I greet people doing this. Right. Um, is there a, uh, to, so, so do you feel that different, and that was one of the questions in the Q and A that, um, cause we are, so by the way, I, so I have a, the, my screen now set that I see the, 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 the people coming in and I see the images, I see, hello, <laughs> but, uh, really you were there all the time, but now I'm like, hey, you're there, hello. That's really, so I think that's such a part for me, so it's like, oh, this is why we should always see faces because it's so different. All of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm not just talking to, you know, an empty screen, I'm talking to, to people and I'd love to see you. So that's, so that's really good. But it's also, you can see, you know, the diversity, uh, not all, and we saw that in the poll, I mean, but, but, but like the different countries, all the different cultures. So is there like, do you, you know, do you need to kind of create um, like a common sort of culture for online because this is sort of where we are all in the same space or is there a difference between the, you know, should we keep the differences between countries or, or is that, is that not an issue at all? What, what do you guys think? I mean, is there, is there, is there, is that a problem? Like in Asia, there's, there are, you know, or in, in, in Latin America, or I don't know, there's different cultures. Do we kind of invent a whole new world online with our, the same kind of rituals or is it, or is this not a topic at all of any interest to you? <laughs> Anyone can answer, by the way. I'll, I'll, I'll answer just yeah, because why not? You are, in my screen, you are called Steve. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Steve. <laughs> the prettiest Steve I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm Brittany Pasternak. Hi, everyone. How are you? Um, yeah, we absolutely need to have rituals in this space, and they are new. Um, that's my answer to the question. And I think <laughs> I do think some of them align around making sure people are comfortable in this space. I um, personally um, loved the like time to settle in. I, all you had to do was say that. And then I was like, okay, like I'm here. I just needed permission to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know that I have an answer to what that, that looks like. Um, I, the, the time is a huge thing that needs to be broadcasted and communicated to anyone that is now facilitating in an online or leading meetings in an online setting because the, it's totally different. And things that you think you can do in an hour, you can't. Things you think you can do in three days, you can't. Um, so that's something that I am, as I'm, I'm attending meetings like this, I'm really shouting from the rooftops because that's something important for everyone that's here to understand about the digital space. But my opinion is yes, we need rituals and yes, we need to make, make the space. Hmm. Anyone else have uh, an opinion from, uh, cause you can all talk now. So. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, try to see your I think it, it, I, sorry, Anna. Okay. Um, I think it doesn't take much. The situation is so much nicer now that I can see all the faces and I see familiar faces from the last few times I see. Pedro, I see Katya, I see Martin, I see all these people and I think, oh my, there you are again. And this is nice. Plus I'm, um, I think that the one hour or one hour and a half maximum thing is becoming a mantra and I'm trying to challenge this. Um, it was unfortunate timing, but I'm, I'm trying to do it next week and um, try out what we can do to make time feel long. So, um, change between online and doing something on pen and paper and because I was so overwhelmed after last week it was exciting it was fun and it was an absolute le learning experience and I was just I came out was just whoa just overwhelmed and I thought oh my god what can we do and I thought is it, yeah it doesn't take much and it's all about rituals I love your cup of coffee on the decomp in the decompression zone thinking about oh, will other people as well go and get a glass of water? And this is nice. So like the palm leaf experience, Emily, was fantastic. And I'll take mm -hmm. that with you, uh, with me today. And uh, um, we need more of that. It's like making, it's like building trust online and, and it's just connecting to basic needs. And that's something that I like about the rituals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Consistent. Uh, hey. We're speaking. 
Yeah, Katja, you, Katja, you yeah. were raising okay. your hand. So one of, by the way, Katja, Perfect. one of the rituals, and you already learned the ritual of uh, hand signals. Because all of a sudden we're in, in, in sign language, right? So, so this is when you want to talk, you raise your hand, and then people know, ah, okay. Well, I've also learned like fist or five, like if you don't agree with what Katja is going to say, you're going to do like this. You're like, I really don't agree with what you're saying. And if you do this, it's like, nah, it's okay. But I'm not really like, this is like, no, nah, okay. Maybe, maybe this is like, no, nah, this is pretty good. This is awesome. This is amazing. But this is, I want to talk. So make sure you have the right language. Uh, you know, anyway, sorry, you go ahead, Katja. Okay, so what, what I found interesting and that I guess is related with culture, but also with the difference of being um, digital or analogical, when people come to meetings or to workshops, what you see is a person. So you look uh, how the person is dressed uh, and what the person brings to you. And now it's different because now we are going to our private places. This morning I had my first Pilates online, so suddenly I was in the bedrooms of my colleagues, of my group from Pilates. So I was seeing if it is a small bedroom or a big bedroom. Actually, I was putting my computer and thought, oh God, what, I, what do I want to share with them? Do I want that they see my bed or then I put it to the mirror? So you create actually scenarios. And when I'm looking to your places, um, yeah, you see some is in a working place and some you see they don't want to know where they are because it's just a white background as I have private pictures. And so, I mean, we can choose what we want to show to the people, uh, the scenario. I mean, in my case, it's my background by the working table where I'm sitting, so it's not constructed. Um, but actually, to uh, the first web, uh, um, first meeting, I looked at the back and I thought, is there information which is secret or something? Do I have to hide something? And I thought, no, it's okay. So we, we have to check a bit what we True. want to share and because it, it's another place now. And actually some of you perhaps in, are in your pyjama because we can't see the trousers. So the clothes suddenly is not important, but the background yeah. <laughs> as Anna is creating. <laughs> Yeah, now actually there's a possibility to have a digital background. <laughs> well, it's so yeah, absolutely. So so to your point, which is really interesting because these are details that we at first don't care about. And then also, so we, Mark and I, before we did this webinar, we were discussing having a green screen uh, behind us, like, because now it's kind of, it's a bit weird now because it doesn't really work because there's no screen, green screen. But it's, but at the same time, we were like, are we, are we going crazy? <laughs> we're like, all of a sudden we're like having green screens, you know, actually, and I went online and I looked uh, on one of the sh online shops for a green screen and they were all sold out. <laughs> so, we're like, <laughs> so we're all having green screens behind us. Um, so now, so next time you're talking to someone, you don't even know if they're actually there where they're, where you think they are. Sorry, who was Johanna. talking? Johanna. Johanna was trying Hi, Johanna. to say about, Hi, about, about Katia's, hello, about Katia's comment. It was really interesting because I was thinking during the lecture that I have started to use kind of a ritual in online meetings lately that uh, instead of weather or corona, I am starting to discuss what is, uh, where, where are we working currently? So, so it's interesting to, to discuss with people who are from different organizations or where, wherever, and uh, it kind of brings the closeness to the online meeting that we kind of sh shortly share where we are working at the moment. And that is also kind of lowering the, the problem that somebody might have a kid or husband or whatever zooming back and forth from behind from time, time to time. So I, I think that is kind of one of the rituals that I have been doing lately. Uh, I was wondering, okay. I, I was, what I okay. thought was uh, really Diana, interesting. Which... Diana, you're next, you have to monitor. Oh, okay, Diana, okay. okay. <laughs> we have to make your list. <laughs> so this, no, so but I, this is I, good, because I, I can actually see you raise your hand. So there's also, <laughs> I think there's a maximum amount of people you should have in any session, because you can actually see them. All right, go ahead, Martin. Yes, please. So I, I was, I really like the, the remark from uh, Wiebke, where we, where I can also imagine that sometimes uh, rituals can also kind of reinforce us of, um, status quo so where you say okay suddenly now we all agree that a uh, lecture or webinar should no take no longer than one half hours which you know you, you should always change that 
And I think that is an important thing because, you know, if we start to, so, so rituals can also be confirming things and then it becomes like an ingrained truth. And I was wondering a little bit if Ted has any ideas about this, that, that rituals can also have kind of negative, you know, that it becomes rutted or that it becomes too, too, too rigid. Uh, well, uh, it depends. <laughs> I hate these questions where the answer is going to be, well, it depends. I mean, I think, I think some people, uh, I mean, if you look, I mean, I grew up a Catholic and my father uh, laments the lack of rigidity uh, that, that, that has been lost uh, after Vatican II. So, so, I mean, some people absolutely love rigidity. And I think maybe for people suffering from uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, then the rigidity of certain lectures, uh, the certain rituals are, are really attractive. I think, I think sometimes it's, it's well, somebody asked a question during the session about uh, things that can change and that meaning, perhaps meanings don't change as much as say the mechanisms. But I think we, we, I think sometimes rituals do uh, change their meaning. And I think as designers, we change the meaning of objects. I think we can also change the meaning of, of, of rituals as well. And I think that uh, it's the values that stay constant. And I think people do move away from rituals that no longer uh, give them what they need or, or the meaning has been lost or the meaning has changed. And I think if you look, I mean, we, we, we mentioned it, Albert Speer earlier, but of course, the the the, the hakakosh the swastika at one time was a, a symbol it had meaning uh, which was actually very positive it was one uh, you know it was one about harmony and peace and whatever you and it still is in in Indian culture but of course the meaning of it changes when it's been applied to something else so I think that um, that that rigid is, some rituals will become too rigid for some people <laughs> and the meaning will change for some people uh, but I th again I think. We, we, we get uh, the, the collective will at some point decide what the meaning of something is, even if there's some power play. And if you read, obviously, Roland Barthes, then, of course, uh, he suggests that there's these kind of structures, these symbols and these mythologies that are created by uh, this uh, kind of uh, the, by society that, that controls people and, and creates the narrative of society. But I think rituals... Uh, have some controlling elements but I also think that people utilize them and they also take over them if they want them to be something else that was a very long answer to your question yeah. sorry Martin. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah. you know yeah, you, yeah. I, I think we could talk about this for an hour uh, Diana oh, because I wanted to give the, the, the floor to Diana because she yeah and she Emily has her hands hand raised she's using the pr proper uh, digital oh. um, <laughs> That's, that's okay. I've talked enough. So, um, and Ted kind of got to what I was going to say. Uh, okay. We, okay. Diana, did you want to? Okay. I will keep it very, very short, um, referring to the constraints of the online. The fact is that even if we share the screen, we don't share the same context as we did in the offline. And this makes it very diffuse and fragmented also for our attention. As Ted said, I see a lot of windows, a lot of uh, Q and A's, I cannot follow everything. And this is why I notice that during the online meetings, uh, I need a more uh, sound related um, rituals uh, that help organize and uh, the clock, uh, the bell, sorry, I have, I have here the, that was, easy. <laughs> that was easy, I have something like that, so around me I have a lot of toys from my, uh, from my little girls that now I need to use in order to set some new rituals that are less visual that you, I usually uh, relate to in offline, <laughs> in offline, <laughs> yeah, and that was so no Pedro, no, no Pedro, no guitar. Sorry. We will leave Pedro uh, finish with a guitar song. I have a mini guitar also here, so that you know. <laughs> that can always come in handy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. never Thank leave you. home without a mini guitar. That's my uh, my mantra. We're um, we are actually thirty minutes. So in in our in our backstage. So I'm very happy that you all joined us uh, backstage. Um, to me, actually, uh, the backstage is usually the most <laughs> fun part um, because uh, it, it allows us to kind of just have some chit chat and there's human connection. So 
I kind of like that. It's a little, a little bit less organized, but I don't know why I, I enjoy that more. Um, we, like I said, so next week we will have more a, a co-creation session on rituals and we will kind of see whether we can actually, you know, make them more concrete and design them for whatever kind of purpose we, we, we need. Um, so far, so thank you very much again, Ted uh, and, and Emily. Thank you for uh, also hanging out with us on uh, in, uh, backstage. Um, yes, we can actually applaud. Hey, um, I, I hope to see you uh, all next week or uh, any other Wednesday at our Wednesday Web Jam. And uh, so we are actually going to sign off and close the show. Everyone, Ed, do you want to say one last thing? If, if if people did want the title of books and stuff, just uh, yeah. get in touch and we'll send that stuff to you. Yeah, I saw awesome. Ezekiel. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. We'll send uh, links to the books and the resources sure. and stuff like that in a follow-up email. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. I'll see, see you next week. Peace, health, happiness.